Actually, I have a little slide for this. This is my contact information and my witty title that I put on business cards when my company doesn't print business cards. But um, I'm a senior software engineer. I work at a company called Apartments.com. Not officially representing them today, but fine with that. Um, I've been coding for about 20 years, actually. I did the math on it, and it scared me. But um, I started out doing uh, like early web stuff, HTML and stuff, and slowly sort of moved my way towards the back end. Did some C++ at one point, and then sort of settled into the mid-tier doing uh, C sharp and back end stuff and database. So that's sort of a little bit, bit about me. Um, I'm, all, I'm often on Slack. You can always ask me questions, talk about stuff. But uh, other than that, we can get started talking about C sharp. The, the structure of this is sort of I want to talk a little bit about C sharp in general. I'll talk a little bit about some of the tools I have. And then what I wanted to do was sort of try to spin up a web service in a, uh, in a, in a short period of time because the .NET Core scaffolding lets you sort of build a web service and do sort of a CRUD app, a to-do list CRUD app, kind of easily. Um, I went ahead and wrote a, uh, an Angular front end for it, which, because Angular is released every three weeks, um, is already slightly dated. But, um, so when we get to that, we can uh, download that from GitHub, or if you go to my GitHub, you'll see there's a couple of repositories that say to-do app on it or to-do API. That's actually the to-do API is me having committed the, the, what we were doing today, um, what we're going to be going through today. I overcommitted in that my bin file got committed and I, I couldn't deal with writing with Git last night, so, um, which I'm sure everyone's fought a little with that. Any questions now? Cool. Okay. So, oh, I sort of went over the slide. We're going to go set up a simple .NET service using .NET Core. We'll learn a couple C-sharp fundamentals and then We'll try to interact with this uh, Angular app to interact with the back end. Yeah, I do have a question. Can you remind us all what a web service is? That's a great question. That's a great question. Um, yeah. If you think about most, I, I'm assuming, because from the chat, but uh, I'm, I'm open to being wrong about this, so people can correct me. A lot of people know about sort of the front end, doing JavaScript, that sort of thing. Somewhere you have to get your data from. So you're going to make a call at some point from, at some point I'm going to go to the whiteboard and start doodling, but um, that's why I keep looking over there. But uh, you have your front end, and then you're going to have your HTTP interaction, which, which is some sort of service, and then you're going to have something sitting there. Most times now, it's a REST service, right? Which means we're using the verbs that come with the HTTP protocol, the put, the post, the gets, that sort of thing and just exchanging data that way with a web server. So that's sort of the server in the back end. So with, you have your JavaScript on the front end, you know, your CSS, your HTML, those sorts of things, and then they're gonna make a call across the network to some sort of server. Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, so the server would be the web service. Yeah, so the web service. But it's basically, a, a web servers will usually be returning JSON or XML, um, almost always JSON these days. And the idea is that, that way you're not pushing across all the HTML over and over again. You're just going to have a simple set of data that you're setting across instead of um, instead of the whole front end coming across again. This is you know your, thick, your thicker clients like a React client or an Angular client can sit there and do deal with the rendering. I consider them thicker compared to just pushing HTML across, where which is not probably a technical computer science way of saying that. Um, if you have an exam tomorrow, don't say that React is a thick line. <laughs> um, but uh, the um, whereas you know that makes the, the web service a little lighter, so you'll have that layer. I'll dive into a little bit of the layers of like a, a web app in a, in a minute. Um, there's this web page, which I'm going to throw into the chat. Well, no, apparently not. Let's see if I can do this real quick. Are people on the Slack right now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm slacking off. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Um, I should keep doing it. No. Okay. okay. I got it. <coughs> um, so that sort of is my master list of things. It also has a link to the slide deck. I'll probably update it with corrections later because cutting and pasting a lot of things causes a little weirdness. These are some things. 
this is on that same on that page that I just sent out. These are some things that we kind of need to install if we're going to do stuff. You need to have Node because you need npm because that's needed for Angular. If you want to run the Angular client, you don't have to run the Angular client, but uh, that's sort of what I'm going to run that to show you guys it. You also need to have version 2.2 of .NET Core if you want to code along with the back end. Um, and it's a little confusing with the versions right now. They're getting 3.0 ready, but I discovered last night everything changed in 3.0, so I'm staying at 2.2 right now. Um, some sort of editor. I'm going to use code today. Uh, you can use whatever editor you want, but if you want to download VS Code, it's a great little editor. It has a lot of plugins for JavaScript, for C Sharp, for a lot of different things. So, um, and I mean, oh, your studio. Studio. what? Oh, yeah. Code. Code. I'm using code. If you have Visual Studio, go ahead and use that. Um, but I'm using code because it's free, it's lightweight, everybody can get their hands on it. At work, I use Visual Studio Professional. It's expensive, it's huge. It does a lot of autocomplete, which is really nice, and I missed it while I was working on this in code. But that's just life. So there's a lot of different Visual Studio, uh, different tools. The, the three major tools for doing C Sharp are Visual Studio. Um, uh, not code, just professional or whatever great community version. Pardon? Enterprise. Enterprise also. I don't think we get it. Are there any IDEs for Visual Studio or for C Sharp? Pardon? Are there any open source IDEs for C Sharp? Uh, not that I'm aware. Not Visual Studio Code developed. seems to be the one they push. Right. Right. You can use Mono develop. That's a good point. It's, uh, it's, it's usually used for stuff like Unity for game development, but it's a really good idea. And that's like cross-platform. I think that's actually what, we, oh no, that's a different one. There's Visual Studio for Mac, which may be free, actually, now that I think about it. No, no that's unfortunate. And then also JetBrains <laughs> makes something, to, I'm sorry. JetBrains makes a, uh, a writer, which is um, really nice. And I haven't used it a whole lot. My boss uses it a lot, and I'm jealous of him. But that's also a paid product as well. Um, about C Sharp. This is a really long blurb about C Sharp. C Sharp is a general purpose, multi-paradigm programming language with strong typing, lexically scoped, imperative, declarative, functional, object-oriented, class-based, and component-oriented programming discipline. What does that mean? A lot of what it means is, the important thing here is it's general purpose to a certain extent, in that they didn't write this with a particular solution to solve a particular problem. Some languages solve certain scripting problems or certain uh, business problems. C Sharp is designed to be similar to Java, a general purpose language. I always, they've continued to throw things into C Sharp over the past, I don't know how many years, 15 years that it's been around, maybe 20. And it's made it that you can, it is classically considered an object oriented language, but they have made it so that you can program in it in other ways, functional ways, things like that. But it's important to know object-oriented to a certain extent in that everything derives from an object and inherits from that. And that's sort of the basis for the language. And that's why every class you'll see will either have an explicit inheritance or, a, um, or an in implicit inheritance from the object class, which has some very basic things in it. We're not going to dive too much into object oriented right now, only because I felt like that was way too big of a topic. And it's, uh, since they've added more features to it, and it's not necessarily the, the thrust of C sharp these days. One important fact, because I know that a lot of people here work in JavaScript, C sharp is strongly typed. And the easiest way to sort of say this is that if something's a string, it's a string always. If something's an int, it's always an int. If it's a certain type of object, it will stay that type of object. There is, in the object-oriented sense, a way around this, which is using interfaces and inheritance. If you declare something as a parent type of object, then it can be any one of the children objects or you can implement an interface. I'm not gonna dig into that too much today because my thrust is to sort of get us coding something, but there are ways to get sort of the, the feel of less strongly typed things without the actual looseness of it. Um, does that make sense? Yes, no, maybe? Okay. Uh, are you going to move forward? Yes. Okay. 
The other thing that's important here is, and this goes back to like, why are there no free IDEs, sort of things like that. Microsoft has been sort of on this march to open source .NET and C Sharp. So the good news is, you can look at the source code for .NET or for the libraries and that sort of stuff, usually on GitHub. They've been uploading Roslyn, the compiler, all this stuff is going to GitHub. You can dig into it. I recently at work, we're not using um, the most, we're not using 3.0, but I knew there was a feature in 3.0 I wanted. So I just started looking at the source code and figured out how to hack it in version 2.1. So you can sort of go through and look at this stuff. It's kind of, it's kind of cool that way. It's a real change for Microsoft if you've been in the Microsoft world for a while. So some things are lagging. They still make a lot of money selling the IDE, so they're not in a rush to give that away. They're giving away code. But on the other hand, other things, and the other thing that's important about this is where 10 years ago, basically the .NET environment exclusively executed on Windows, and now it pretty much operates everywhere. Um, <laughs> for example, in my current job, we have stuff that deploys on Windows servers that are running our IS, Internet Service <coughs> Internet Information Server. We also have a whole bunch of stuff that deploys to AWS and Docker containers on ECS. It's all running on Linux. So you can write it one place. It's great because you can write it one place and hopefully deploy it to multiple places. There are always gotchas with that. I will admit that if you're deploying to Linux and you're writing on a Windows box, the way the environment variables work is different and things like that. So just be aware of that. Like It's not purely deploy once. Going back sort of to the earlier question, what is, we're gonna, I'm gonna start diving a little more into what we're gonna do. We're gonna do sort of a, uh, this is one of the drums. Okay. <laughs> So this is what I was sort of saying earlier, is that we have sort of our front end, which can be any kind of client, right? It can be a JavaScript client, web client. It could be another application. It could be uh, a, um, an iOS app, right? It can be whatever kind of client. And so that's sort of, and I'm thinking of internet connected apps. I'm, I sort of focus on that. So if I skip over something and I seem confusing, tell me to clarify. Beyond that, we sort of have an API that those things can call. And this is where I'm sort of focused today, which is basically hosted on a web server. So this is the browser. You know, we have a web server down here. And that's gonna have an API, a mid-tier maybe, where you have your business logic that spans multiple API calls, and then hopefully some sort of, I'm gonna draw a database, and please don't laugh at me. Oh, that didn't even work, okay. <laughs> yep, still can't draw a database on a whiteboard. Okay, so, and basically, uh, that's supposed to be a cylinder. Can on Facebook, or? What? Yeah, hold on, let me, that's, I'm not gonna try to fix it. So, where? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't have thought of that. So, we're just going to make a box. There we go. <laughs> Database. Yes. Okay. There we go. And, you know, some sort of data storage, whether that's a document database, a MongoDB, your, your classical SQL database of some sort. So, like, what we're going to talk about today is right here where you need to define something that your web app is gonna call and hopefully get some data back. I'm gonna do it basically a to-do app in that that's a pretty classic CRUD app. You, uh, CRUD, uh, everyone familiar with the term CRUD? Create? Okay. No. No? Not unless you're talking about like the stuff that you scrape off of your, okay. <laughs> the hood of your stove or something. 
create, read, update, delete. So it's basically the four major things that your any given application will do. Create your data, read the data, update the data, delete the data. So in a to-do app, you're gonna create a to-do, you're gonna read back your list of to-dos, you're gonna update one, and then you'll delete it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. All right. So I'm gonna throw another crazy term out. Um, it's called POCO. There's also uh, yeah, pretty ordinary C, C sharp object. <laughs> um, there's also JOKOs with Java. It just comes from the Java world, so it's not actually a good acronym because it's Java. Um, sorry, I, I make fun of Java sometimes, and I don't know why. But, um, but basically, I, for me, there's two types of C sharp objects that you're going to see today. One I call a POCO, or a data object, or some sort of representation of data, and the other will be our serv uh, the thing that represents our service. So this object, or this class, it's not an object yet until it's instantiated, this class basically consists of a namespace, is that, can you guys see this okay? Or? Yeah. Okay. A namespace, which is basically saying where lexicographically this thing exists, the name of the class, a to-do item, and then the properties of the class. And, and their type. So this is a long, so a, a number of an ID, and you can get and set it, and it's public. So anyone can access this object. You have a string that's going to be a title. I was wondering, do you have to define get and set in there before you can do it, or is that just like a really simple vision that you're going to? That's generally, this is how I do them because convention wise, go ahead. No. Okay. Convention-wise, I do this because um, when you, if you need to expose them with uh, attributes or something like that later, it wants to read the get and setter as opposed to it's sort of making it clear that it's not a private. So this is more convention. You could just leave it as public, but everywhere I've been, this is how they do the C sharp. Uh, so that is something you have to define, like in your parameters. Oh, you don't have to define it. This is this is the extent of it. It's saying there's a getter and a setter. You're just gonna they're oh, implied. Okay. There's no need to do any more than that. This is the get and set. So right there, you're actually creating the prototypes of functions, or? Um, I hesitate to say that because it's not a prototypical language, but I'm it's sort like, of. I'm not familiar with C sharp. That's it's okay. I'm um, I would say this is more. These are based in the. You know, I don't have the best explanation for the get and set. It's a really good question. Are those functions? Yes. They're basically saying, set this value here to this, get the value out of this. And it's making an implied, um, the .NET framework is making an implied uh, private for you. And then later on, you're gonna have to define those. No, we're not gonna do anything else. This is it. This is it for this class. So are these like instructors or like properties? Or? Be, these are properties, and these are saying this is the function that this defines a function to get and set it. The the reason you have these here is it's possible to omit one, so you can have one that's private settable, so it can only be set in the constructor, which this class doesn't even have because the constructor is actually implied, or you can have it um, protected, so only an inherited class has it. So this is basically saying allow for this object the get function and the set function. Does that make more sense? And I'm gonna write this down because I feel like I should do a better explanation of it. Do you have a good book you can recommend on learning C sharp? I will, I will look for something to recommend after this. I don't have one off the top of my head. Uh, the ones I learned from were pretty old. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend them right now because they were like 1.1. Yeah, if you just dive in the document, I'll look around a little and have something. Yeah, really it's one of these things right. I'm, I'm versed in. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll have to check it out then. I say normally you go to like the documentation site and it just like it's all this dry documentation and it doesn't tell you where to start, or what you need to know to get basic going. So the other kind of class we're going to see is what I'm going to call a controller. You'll note that up at the top here we have this using command. That means we're including a library basically. It's saying use this library. Um, namespace, which is saying, hey, it's going to be in, you know, able to be found in this area, and then 
These are called decorators. And basically what's happening here is something else in the code, in the framework, is going to insert code based on this and manage your, what you're saying. So it's saying, hey, whatever web server picks this up, here's my route to find it. <laughs> and by the way, this is an API controller, so when the whole service starts up, load this into your API. And then we have a class decoration like we had before. So we had a class here, public class, but this one is explicitly inheriting from the controller base. So that's a built-in class that basically represents a web controller. And then we have a constructor here, and I actually just cut off the class after that. But the constructor, we're gonna do some work in the constructor when we start seeing more of it. Um, okay. The last thing I want to sort of go over an anatomy of is this is what, if we build a pro, if you build along with me, this is what the project's going to look like. And I just want to go over sort of the folders real quick so it makes sense. So that controller we just saw will live in the controller folder. The models, or the, the POCO, will live in the model folder. The object folder, don't worry about this. This is something that gets generated by, by your compiler. Properties, basically have some settings for your project. Um, as well as the app settings. And then we have a program, that's actually the entry point that the executing environment will first read. So if you're having problems, sometimes you can look here and start to figure it out. And it's gonna call something called startup. This is where it figures out everything it's gonna do. And then this is just a project file, which basically is saying, here's, all the fi here's a description of a project. All right, so that's sort of some rough run through of some early stuff. Is that all? Anyone have any questions right now? It might make more sense if we do something. It might make less, less sense, and then I can try to answer questions. Hey, really quick, can you back up a couple slides to that controller thing? Yeah. Uh, I don't see closing. Is that just because? I, that's just the off? first part of it. I couldn't fit any more than this before my uh -huh. my slide We're gonna do degenerated some. quickly. All right. So I am going to. <clears throat> How many people have been able to install the prerequisite stuff, the framework and stuff like that? How many people are still trying to install that? Okay, so we're pretty good. Okay. So I just want to know if I should wait for a few minutes or if we're in good shape. Okay. Um, sounds like we're in good shape. So, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna make this larger. So this is sort of my my outline, and I realize that I only have one screen, so this is gonna be. Fine. So should we initialize a new uh, C sharp project? Um, yes, but I have the commands to do that here. So I think. So the first thing I would do is create a new folder to hold up. We're gonna have two projects basically. Okay. <laughs> um, I put everything in a source folder because that's what I do. Also, if there's something weird on this, I share this computer sometimes with my 17-year-old son, so he keeps putting weird things on here and I keep <laughs> deleting them. <laughs> it's a lesson in not sharing things. Um, so I, w I would start out with creating a new folder that's just gonna be C-sharp service. Above this, I have a completed version of it because I was trying to run this myself. I like the dog food things. Is that term people know? Like dog, dog fooding? Food. Dog fooding goes back to Microsoft. The idea, uh, actually it's an old Microsoft term, the idea of using your own software, using your own tools. So eating your own dog food. Um, but of course it was sort of derogatory in that originally they would say, oh, we don't eat our dog food, we use other software. But, um, oh. <laughs> but, and then we make, but what a it's become a way to, to, yeah, what a way to insult your users, but it's become a way of saying, Use your tools. Like, if you build something, you have to run through it and figure out how it works. So, that's a term I use a lot is dog fooding. So, as far as directory code, you should just make one for this C sharp service. Just one C sharp folder. folder. Pardon? And then put a source folder in that. Uh, no, you don't need to make a source folder in that. Just make a C sharp folder, and then um, I'm going to open up a command window because this is just the way I have this set up at the same time. And so we're going to have two projects here. One is going to be an Angular project, and one is going to be a C-sharp project. <coughs> the Angular project is completely done. You just need to pull it from Git, if you have Git installed. Do most people have Git? 
Um, you can also, how can we get this? Let me open something else real quick. That's how most people know me online, is that, that avatar. I'm sorry. Uh, I can put this link to download it by Git, but I remember people don't have Git installed. Is that true? Uh, we try to get as many people on Git as we can as soon as possible. So. How many people have like a Git client on your desktop? Oh, okay, you're in good shape. I, nobody raised their hand the first time I said that. I, I, I may have said that unclearly. I'm sorry. We forgive you. If I'm going too fast or something, slow me down. I've had a lot of caffeine today. To make sure that I was as sharp as possible. <laughs> Yeah. So I'm just navigating over as slowly as possible to the folder I just created. Although apparently I can't type in front of people. I forgot about that problem. <coughs> and then I'm going to run the git command that I had sort of put in there and I'll throw this into the slack. Looks like there's a typo in that. Oh no, there isn't. There's a typo in my typo. I don't want to get distracted into Angular, but I'll very briefly say it's a framework, the, the, the front end front framework uses, uses TypeScript. It's nice because it's sort of all inclusive. You bring down the framework, you use it. Um, I'm a, I, I use it a lot at work, but not a, I'm not a hardcore expert. The downside of this repository is I'm terrible at CSS. So basically, it is the most boring thing ever to look at. So I'm just going to navigate into that Angular app. Do an npm install. I'm really slow. Nice. If it's easy, pardon? You've been busy. Uh, I, I stole that from somewhere. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't steal it. Actually, okay. while it's downloading, I'll, I'll admit, I did not steal it. I'm, I wish I was able to steal it. I tried to steal it, and it turned out that somebody coded it in Angular 6. And so then I had to spend an enormous amount of time figuring out how to make it work in Angular 8. So, so you did them a favor. Yes. So for the .NET framework, do, you know, do we need the all core downloads or just the .NET core SDK? Um, because the link you gave was for Windows. There's a second link I actually found, I'm sorry. Yeah, the, uh, oh. I'm just wondering which one that we need for this. The core, .NET core, not the framework, the core 2.2, I think the SDK will follow, will cover it. Okay, the, the SDK, so we don't need all the core downloads. No. Okay. Okay. So the next thing I'm gonna do is create a another new folder called to do API. This is where we're gonna run some uh, .NET Core commands. So the cool thing about .NET Core is that they put a lot of scaffolding in. So if you go to your directory, you can just run this command. You know what, that really didn't help, Faust. So 
Sorry, my mouse had a failure. There we go. So you can run .NET, new web API, and it build, will build a new web API named to do API. Does that make sense? Uh, you walk us through that. So yes. So if you navigate to the folder, you did, uh, to a new folder called to do API that you create, and you're at a terminal. Does that make sense? Yeah, I got changed directly to the terminal. Okay. You can run this .NET command. The first thing you want to do is actually just type in .NET and see if you have .NET installed on your terminal. And if that does bring up a bunch of options, you can run a command called .NET new web API dash I to do API. That's going to be <coughs> out the scaffolding for a new .NET app. Oh, I was in the wrong folder. <laughs> I'm going to do that a second time in the right folder. <laughs> oh, there's the list of things. Okay. I'm going to open this up in an editor. So this generated, and this is actually not what I wanted. No, oh, that's right. Okay. So this generated a web, a web API. There's a simple web API here. There's a controller here that says called values controller. It looks a lot like the one that we just looked at in the slides. I should make this bigger probably. Yes? Yeah. People still see it? Yes? No? Cool. Thanks. So I'm going to briefly talk about this because this control, this, so this controller basically is where the web API will be. We can actually put a new, I have basically a new one to replace this. That's the instructions. But I wanted to, since I'm running a little slow, um, I wanted to talk, I'll, you know, you can look at this controller and see what's, what's happening here. Um, so the first thing we need to do is I, actually I would suggest if you want to follow along with what we're doing, deleting this controller because we're not going to use it. Nice controller, that's yes. Yeah. Value, yeah. It it's, it's complaining about that. No, it just made And then this is sort of uh, By default, these run in different uh, environments. So um, you have to do a cores mm -hmm. connection. So um, uh, if you open up the launch settings, which are inside of properties, uh, and navigate to line 24, and replace that, actually line 23, and replace that so that we'll be able to use our new controller. <coughs> you said uh, delete uh, line 24 and replace it with that? Yeah, actually. The application, oh, line 23. Line 23 and 24, I'm a, my, my apologies. Um, the other thing we need to do is go into our startup. This is where everything gets loaded for this web service. And we need to enable cores in here, which I'm just going to do this, and I can explain what cores is later, because it was sort of a huge bugaboo for me about cross-posting. So on line 22. So this one will have a global thing. I don't have to 
I'm sorry, one more time. You yes. said delete line 23 and 24. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then open up the other screen. Yeah. Then open up the startup. <coughs> We're going to change a couple things in startup where we're going to change line 22, line 29. We need to add this. We don't replace this one. They didn't leave much space for me. And on line 53 in startup, we need to add this course thing that is. Uh, basically allows cross-platform posting. So it allows the Angular app and the web service to talk to each other. On uh, line 29, do we add it after the, the brackets or in the brackets? Inside the brackets. So your startup should look like this, and I will post the, the, what the startup should look like in, <coughs> in chat. Okay. How are people doing? Oh, you're already ahead of me. <laughs> so there's a creating a models folder. So for me, there's basically two parts to a service, a simple service. There's a controller that handles the I.O. with the web server. The model is basically the data. So you can grab, create a models folder, create a new file there, call it um, ViewItem.cs. And you can paste that in there, and you've got a model. Yeah, okay, uh, here's a silly question. Um, okay. Try creating a new file. I don't have a workflow background to access the folder inside Visual Studio, even though I'm sure that's 101. Um, I'm looking for how to create a folder. No, just the file. Oh, and um, uh, yeah. it's under web. Funny that was only been the CC shirt. So I see web form, master page, web user control, HTML, class style sheet. Uh, it's kind of weird, it's this web context. <coughs> I think what you're looking for is just Sorry. basically yeah. a C sharp a class yeah, file. Like a file. <coughs> just a class file. Alright. I'm gonna go one more forward and then I kind of talk for you can talk for okay. The next file you want to create is the controller. So there's a to-do's controller. So in the controllers file folder. Create that, and if you paste the data from here, we'll have the basics of a controller. Is that, is anyone, can I help anyone at this point? Is that sort of enough to be able to do something if you have that? Yeah. Is anyone caught up with me? Do I move? No. Okay. Well, I started. Before, so. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I'm moving kind of fast. Does anyone have a specific <coughs> question I can help with? No, no. Yes. I was wondering, what are all these files doing right now that you're, like, uh, that you're adding? So the model file is going to represent your data. So the to do .item .api. That's it. Works out like to do item to do item that cs represents basically a, a, a single to do item we're going to make a list of those with a service so the service here 
is basically saying, let's is, is basically saying expose this to. Uh, actually, we need one more thing in here, which is the next step. The uh, the post operation. This is saying save one of these. So I'm going to grab that real quick just because I know this is taking me longer than I expected. Um, so basically this file, we can walk through this file actually, this is a good file to talk about. So the things in this file are, if you start at the top, let me get this guy gone. This is our controller. This is basically the web service. So everything around this is scaffolding. It's .NET's way of managing stuff. It's like the Angular app. It's like your React backend. This is just, this is your code. So you have that model file, and then you have these using, these are the libraries that are coming in. So this is just, hey, we're going to use these libraries. And then we have a class called Todos Controller. That inherits from controller base. So that means we're getting all this ability from the .NET framework to do things. So whether that's to interpret post, at, post um, posts or gets or puts or any of those things. Um, I've declared, this is, this is an interesting, what I decided is to try to simplify this as much as possible. Usually you would have some sort of data back end some of the online things have DB context. I made a dictionary. A dictionary is a key value pair. It's not concurrent, so only one user can use this at a time. You should never go to production with your data store as a dictionary in your class. <laughs> this is to make it as simple as possible so that in one class, we can contain everything that we're doing. Is there a difference between a dictionary and an ordered dictionary? Um, one's ordered. That's really the difference, is that a dictionary may be stored in any way where they're not maintaining the order. So you may put something in, and it's not guaranteed to come out in the same order. Um, that's, that's it, really. So the other one, it has a third, third ordering piece. So, <laughs> on line 18, or roughly 18, there's a, there's a constructor. In C Sharp, the constructor is the thing that's run when the class starts up. And what this constructor is doing is it's taking that dictionary and that count of objects and saying, hey, make sure that they are nude up. Make sure that they aren't null anymore, that they can be used. And lastly, I went ahead one more step and grabbed the, uh, the post command, which is being able to save something to, the, uh, to this dictionary. So in this, the first thing we have is public, meaning anyone can access it. <coughs> to do item is the thing that it's going to return back. So it's actually going to send back one of our classes. Post is the name of our command. This is actually cool. I, uh, I actually didn't know this existed until I worked on this, which is that you can actually have a tag that says, I'm going to read the HTTP body in. So it's actually reading from the body of your HTTP, all built from the .NET scaffolding. You get it for free. It's nice. So it's going to try to map it to our class, and it's going to name that value. So on this, I'm trained mostly, and uh, whenever I write up a web service, to make sure that if things are null, you blow up, you push back. So I'm saying, hey, if what I'm about to try to save to doesn't exist, throw this exception and you'll get an error. Shouldn't happen because you fix this in your constructor. Then we're going to map the new values to one of our models. And on line roughly 47, depending on how you paste it, we're going to try to add it to our dictionary. We're going to save it, basically. If you're writing all the way down all those layers, you'd be trying to save to your database at this point. <clears throat> and then we're going to return it back just in case the service needs it. Partly we've updated it with a new ID, so we want to tell the client what that looks like. So I'm going to switch back. Does that make sense? Does anyone have questions about that? Nope. <clears throat> 
Um, I'm kind of wondering on step nine, where do you post it? Or on what scope? Um, you want to put that, oh, in the scope. You want that right under your constructor. So when this constructor to do's controller, which is a constructor, closes, you want to put that right basically around line 31, 32, uh, that okay. area. It's defining another function. So I'm going to switch back to where we, the, the window where I started that. I'm going to type in .NET run. Hopefully this will compile. Moment of truth. Yeah, no. It's not just me. OK. Model. You know what? I saw this. Oh. This part of the presentation goes smooth. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> You know what? Make sure you've saved everything. The reason mine's failing, it's not saved, I think. Yes, make sure you save your file. Commit it to disk. Does that help you? Or are you still getting that error? Oh, well, it's not immediately yelling at me, but oh, there it is. Still, still yelling at you? Yeah, it says I got a name <coughs> that cannot be contained members such as fields or methods. Uh, oh, yeah. that means, I know what that is. I will come over and help you out in a second. There's something placed in the wrong place in the scope of the curly brackets. Uh, um, so right, you know, okay, I will show you guys that in a second. <coughs> um, actually, what I'll show you right now, which is the, basically the curly brackets work this way. This one opens up the namespace, the yeah. top one. And there will be a corresponding closing of it. Similarly, there will be another one that opens class. And this is one of these things I take for granted. I'm very sorry that I was not clear about this. There's one that opens the class, and at the bottom, closes that's the class. A problem. Yeah, that's a problem. This is supposed to be the second to the last, so I just got to take everything I pasted and just put it ahead of that. <coughs> I do this. Oh, inside of it? Yeah, because I'm not inside a class, I'm inside a controller. Yeah, whatever. So, this should and then be each the function has a set of curly brackets. My, may I cope with that? That's really my mistake, not to make that clear. So, that line that we asked, that line should be inside which set of curly brackets? Yeah, process Which one? The line that you add to 23? Yeah, the one that's like app. Oh, yeah. All right. Okay. Um, that should be services.add4, is that one? This? No, okay. um, the next step is here. This one? It should go yeah. in between the curly brackets for the function configure. same far and you'll see a very very rudimentary angular app because I have no design skills whatsoever um, <laughs> I can actually code design not so much what's the URL for them that is gonna be localhost 4200 oh, colon 4200 yeah okay so I'm freaked out that's that's okay you want that that's your back end yeah. so what's happening here is that 4200 is your <coughs> angular app the first thing we built and 3000 is your web API. And you're gonna make a call basically from the Angular app to the web API. So, 
So one of the downsides to C-sharp, you got all this great hot reloading with JavaScript usually, usually with React and stuff. No such thing with the web server in uh, .NET. So you end up having you need to change, shut it down, restart it. So every time I'm making a change, I go Control C, crush it, type in .NET run, and do it again. Then I reload this, and I still get an error. Uh, method not allowed. Hmm. Oh, that's because I haven't implemented the get yet. You should still be able to do a post. Uh, and now I'm getting a close error again. Um, One second, let me check one more thing. Did it work for anyone, or are you all getting fours errors? <clears throat> yeah. I, mean, I think you have to have a header in your request, maybe in your Angular app. It's working for me on Postman. I'm posting and getting. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I think you have to, in the Angular app, you have to make sure you're sending the header. I don't know, maybe you did, but I it says control allow origin. It says it's missing. That. And fire. Well, okay, yeah, and I understand that. That's the core error that I've been basically struggling with for a week. Um, let me make sure that I put everything in here. But that I need to do it in the, in the proper direction. Oh. Is that what you're going? Yeah, I did. I'm briefly going to go over to my known working copy. I think I know what happened. Yeah. Okay. In the startup, I'm sorry about this. There was another thing I had to do literally at 10 o'clock last night to get cores to stop harassing me. Which was the, uh, actually, let me just post, is everyone on Slack? Mm -hmm. Let me post the startup sure file on Slack. Slack. If you're not on Slack, I can come around and show it to you. But here is what the startup should be. There's additional things in there that are going to make me pull out my hair. Is there anything cool? Because I mean like. No, it's unfortunate because the course is actually what I spent more time on in this presentation than almost anything else, and it's not at all what I want to talk about or you know you want to hear about. Where does this uh, get pasted into? The startup.cs. Let me put that in there. Oh, I have to shut it down and start. So basically, just replace everything with that. Just replace everything, man. Just everything. <coughs> So I know that we were supposed to be about 40 minutes. Basically, from this point on in that tutorial, in the thing that I've written there, it just adds the rest of the CRUD applications. So if people want to keep working on it, I'm willing to stay here and work on it with people for a little bit, for as long as, you know, I know we go to five with social and stuff like that. I don't want to keep standing here and forcing you to watch me, but I will come out and help anybody. But does that make sense, or would you like me to keep going? 
I talked to about 20 something people in this room. You guys, what would you rather me do? What do you want me to do? Keep going. Keep going. Okay, I'll keep going. Somewhere. Great. Got this. Where are I? Wait for me. How many people have the ability right now to do what I just did, which is to open up 4200, type something in, and have it successfully go through? Are we getting a 405 error? You're getting a 405 error. Okay, that push, means, the, push, did you get a 405 error? Then you could put it in? Uh, no, it gives me a course block. Okay, you have the course problem. How many people have a course problem? Like, if you open up F12 on your browser, do you see this weird red stuff that says course? I'm restarting the server. <laughs> Does anyone have it working? No, okay, cool. Let's debug a little, which is my favorite thing. I got it working now, yeah. Okay. Copy and pasted your startup and now it works. Okay, so I'm sorry about the startup thing. Cores, briefly so you know what is torturing me, um, is that they block the ability to make calls from one, from one domain to another domain. And as far as Google's concerned, a domain is, as far as Chrome is concerned, in Firefox, a domain is anything with a different port. So you have to elect, and this is for security reasons, they don't allow this. Basically the web server is gonna say, don't do this. So you usually have to allow calls across them. I discovered last night that every version of .NET Core right now seems to do cores in a different way. So I was fighting with 3.0 for about two hours, and then I went back to 2.1, which is 2.2, which is what we're doing, which is actually documented on the internet. Um, okay, so let's go back to looking at the C sharp real quick. So if you paste that startup file. You should be not getting the cores error, but you may still get a 405 when you first load localhost 4200. The reason you're getting a 405 is the first thing that Angular app tries to do is it tries to do a get command. We haven't implemented that yet. So no <laughs> error. Angular smartly will continue to try rendering, and you can then put in a, uh, if you want to try it, you should be able to type it in, and it'll look like, okay, let me clear this. It'll have a little message that says to do, and it looks like it's saved, and it'll show it in, in the browser. I need to get closer. So it'll show what you're doing. Is that happening after the initial 405 error? Or no. Okay. It does work on post Yeah. Okay. Does anyone else have, uh, okay. briefly, does anyone know what, how many people know what Postman is? Okay. Postman's a great little tool that, um, that doesn't tell you anything though. Postman is a tool for testing web APIs. Yeah. Um, it basically is testing calls to an endpoint. You can call anything with it. So in this case, um, you can pick the command. It's a good tool to download. I think if I try to go into it, it might make it more confusing right now. But if you know it and you can do that, that helps. But, um, and I can check it. What, are most people getting four, uh, four or five? I'm trying to gauge what to do to solve this. Slug it up, download and track it. Really? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to do an NPM install in the directory, see if I'll fix something. It's like well, that's orders. Weird. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, um, how many people are able to write dot, type .NET build from your command line and that compiles? trick here is, I think, if you open up, I'm trying to get some feedback and I'm not sure where to go next yet. Uh, 
if you does it does anyone have it building? So if you type if you do dot net build from your command line, does that work for you? Okay. Do you know where to put dot do you this okay. So that means we have code issues. Mm -hmm. Yes? I think I can have a warning here. It says your global, I was running an ng surf and your global Angular client version 8.3.3 is greater than your local version 8.1.3. Yeah. Do you have CLI version? Is that a problem? No. Okay. That is not actually a problem. Um, so they should open a second command window. That's, yeah, that's that one that in my second command window. That is in your second command window. So my first command window, I'm going to try to do the uh, .NET run again. Okay, cool. But try doing .NET build first. Huh? .NET build. Do that one? Yeah. Do build? Okay. Come on. Okay. Come out. I'm just peering over to see if I can. How do you uh, cancel? How do you cancel a run again? Control C. Oh, this thing wasn't done. Okay. <coughs> I'm not saying 
Are you having the startup issue? Of course. Issue again? Thank <laughs> you. 
just trying to figure out the course order. I'm trying to figure out. I, apparently, the uh, <coughs> startup thing is not right that I posted. I'm trying to figure out what exactly I did wrong there. So let me take one second. So, anyone who grabbed it from Slack, it seems like the startup file I put up there has, I think I must have not copied something. I haven't figured out what because it's not failing on mine. But everybody seems to be seeing the same problem. Oh, um, did they copy and paste from Slack? Yeah. Oh, so oh. sometimes Slack like changes their characters. Okay. Um, especially when it's like oh. quotes and stuff like that. Let me post a link to a file. Was it not a piece of code snippet? What? Was it piece as a code snippet? Was. Oh, and then yeah. I don't get it. That's yeah. It's a weird thing for me too. So, but it seems like only people who have pulled that down. I might have accidentally hit like hit like the keyboard or something with the mouse over the file and added a character somewhere that you didn't intend to. Exactly. So that's what I'm trying to. So the, this right here is in the wrong camel is in the wrong case. Yeah, I think it's just if you look if you compare it to uh, the startup.cs, it's uh, written slightly differently. Uh, which two files are you heard? Okay, uh, startup is in there. It looks to be the same. Yeah, for some reason it's the same on mine, but maybe something happened when it got pasted 
and it keeps happening and it's so it should be capital T O D O capital A P I. Yeah. Linter, maybe. Change the startup one to make sure the T is cast. I don't know why. No, no, no. The startup, okay, so the startup.cs namespaces like to do API cap T, okay? And yeah. program is lower case T. There you go. So which do we want? I, I mean, you want traditional to whatever is in program, put in startup. Oh, okay. Okay. That's a good bug you planted. Yeah. That's very good. Very um, good. C sharp is case sensitive, and it will make you crazy. Unfortunately, apparently, it just uh, that was a year off my list. The is that working for anybody at this point? What? Uh, apparently, in the depending on the casing of how you made your project, if you made it with a lowercase t, the code I pasted in startup needs to be lowercase t. If you didn't case, it depends. You need to have the casing match for the namespace. Are you having the startup error, or are you having what yeah. issue? Um, the namespace startup cannot be found. Okay, so go oh, to okay. startup.cs oh, uh -huh. and make sure that it matches the, the, this line, 14, that the casing in startup.cs matches the casing in program.cs. Because basically this is saying, it's grouping everything into this, into this <coughs> namespace. So if you don't have them matching, then it's not going to work. Success than that? Well, I mean, like, the main console's not yelling at us anymore, but we're still getting stuff in the page. Right. Okay. Are, are you clean? Let's see, it built, um, we still. Yeah, I'm getting uh, error caution in my reviews. Okay. Yes. <laughs> API service handler. So the first time you should get that when you load localhost 4200. Yes. Try entering something in the box and see if that goes through clean. Should have done it yet first. Uh, yeah, it's more of the same. What's it say then? Uh, it says, I to do title, corn, one of <laughs> complete, false, and then it just has the same errors again. Handle error. Cool. Empty response. Okay. Can we see your. Okay, so just follow the traditional camel case. And, uh, well, so this is one of these weird things where you get into languages things, and I should have thought of this being JavaScript engineers. Uh, objects are upper always. In yeah, in C sharp, generally it's uh, upper camel case. I call it upper, upper camel case. It starts with an upper. I do it second nature, and I apologize. It's not a problem. Um, on the
Dude, are you past this? Mm -hmm. Let me see your fossils. So this I is four zero. Yeah, and then I'm good. Well, mine. That one's caps. No, actually. Hey, can you show me your photos up to you?
Yeah, I think a couple of people got no. running. Are you still, 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 still having the two arrows?
No. I don't know. The guy, the guy who fucking sent you it? Harlan. That's it. Is that it? Oh, no. But I'm trying to just help people out. But I'm. Are, are they all just trying to figure it out? Or yeah, people are just trying to figure it out. So, no, I asked because we're the live stream. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. I, I, I don't know. Do we tell them are we good? Or? Yeah. So, you know. Perfect. That's good. No, it's not like that. Okay. We have three people. Does that make you go? It does make you go. Just like you're trying to get Yeah, so if there's any questions, a couple of people are able to get running. If you can send them to Instagram, be sure that you can use Sorry, I'm not